Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How was Dreamforce? It's five o'clock on day two. We're glad to know that you're alive and you're with us. And we hope you're ready to learn about modern app development and modular development strategies. If not, just stay put, because you're here with us now. For the next 40 minutes, it's a bit dark now, so don't fall asleep. But we are trying to make you not fall asleep. Right. And who are we? So I'm not Zane Turner. And I am not Renee Winkelmeyer. And we are happy to be here with you all. Exactly. So the most important slide that you will see during Dreamforce, you like to know that? The forward-looking <laughs> statement, right? So please make any purchasing, purchasing decisions based on what you find currently in product. We are showing a few things, which are currently not GA. So please try them out. But Make your decisions only what you will find in the product. So what are we talking about today, Zane? So we're talking about a whole bunch of stuff, but we wanted to start by just checking in about who's heard of Salesforce DX. It's a great start. So Salesforce DX is a whole bunch of tools and a whole bunch of functionality that essentially help you do application lifecycle management. That's what it is. But it's also a shift for those of you that are used to working in the Salesforce ecosystem on those things in that what's under the hood is a bit different because it's open and it's prescriptive. It's built on standards that you might find in other fields, shipping other kinds of apps. You can bring those same skills and tools into the, your workspace now. You can write plugins for our CLI or our command line interface. You can bring your, the, your favorite tools to play. And we're gonna show you some of the tools that we prefer using, but just because we're using one particular IDE doesn't mean that you have to anymore. We're trying to make things more open. So one question, because nearly everyone raised their hand, how many are actually of you using Salesforce DX? OK, a few. It's also pretty good. Cool. And maybe more people will find out they're using DX than they thought by the end of the session. The other thing is, is that it's, try, it's built to try to make automated delivery easier. CI, CD, all of those good things that require not a human doing something, debugging, and wondering why things aren't going as well as you would expect. And to that end, it's also built for the enterprise. It's built for real, rigorous development. It's built for scale. It's built for all the things that we expect to be able to run our businesses or the people that trust us to run their businesses for them. So. All of this is a big promise, but we're talking here today about ways that you can deliver continuously no matter what your deployment looks like, whether you're trying to get stuff into a single org or you're dealing with many orgs. We want to have tooling that supports all of those things. And so this is where we might be at today, or those of you may be familiar with, is we have a great idea and we want to get it into production at some point, right? And in between, there's one or two things that need to happen, and they happen in sandboxes, right? So we want to code some things, we want to build some things, we want to test some things, and those things might happen actually across several different environments. And when you want to move stuff between environments, you have several different options. Today, we might be using the metadata API, or we're going to be using change sets, and by that I'm talking about you go into setup, and you type in change set, and you click things, and you deploy a change set that way. And we also now have unlocked packages that have been in beta. Who's been experimenting with unlocked packages at all? That is, that's awesome. So you have all of these choices for deployment. How do you put it all together? Well, we know that it's not easy to do that, right? We can have conflicting versions of something somewhere. Or if I built one thing in one sandbox and Renee built another thing in another sandbox and we're deploying to yet another sandbox, whose changes will win, right? And of course, it's because there is no single source of truth. Those of us that are familiar with this model know the source of truth for what you're building is kind of the last environment where you successfully deployed it no matter how much blood, sweat, or tears it took to get it there, right? That's your source of truth. So then if I come in and I refresh the wrong sandbox, guess who's not releasing, right? Salesforce DX, the tools and methodology behind it offer you a chance to shift that source of truth. We want to shift that source of truth to source control, to version control, to a place that's built for handling change, built for handling I want to merge something in, it's inconsistent, who got it there first, which version should win. And this big wheel that you may have seen in several of these DX sessions is trying to show you the fact that we're putting source in the middle 
and we're going to give you different tools. We see those little lovely little icons like the screwdriver and the crescent wrench, which have something to do with how we build stuff, apparently. Those tools support different parts of this cycle. And then we even go on to the other side of the wheel where we're getting the functionality that supports those parts of the cycle. Packaging is a new thing that you can do as a customer that you may only have been able to do before if you were working with managed packages and working as a partner. So this, we're opening up all the parts of the cycle, and as the product gets bigger, as the tools get expanded, this is going to keep growing. So what does that mean for those of you that actually want to deliver some stuff? This is what you have today if you're doing what we're going to start calling org-based development. If you're building something in one place and you need to move it to another place, right? And we're using good old change sets here. And there's a new command coming to the CLI, which you maybe have seen and you're going to see in action very soon, called source deploy and source retrieve, which lets you keep this me method of development in between orgs, but now using the CLI. Now you can do it from the command line interface, in the tool you want to use, you don't have to go into the UI. But what if you want to bring source into the equation? So now we can use the things we knew before, but we can also now commit those things we're pulling, those things we're retrieving into a source control. And then we can deploy from source to any kind of org. So now we can synchronize all these different orgs from source without changing much about our app development lifecycle, all we have to do is start using source control and start using the CLI, and we're going to show you some of that. But what if you want to get even more complicated? Well, we can add in different kinds of orgs. So you can see here, we don't have to just use source deploy and source retrieve. We can use source push and source pull and start using scratch orgs, because now that we have source control, we can start creating even more kinds of environments. More functionality in DX is available to us once we bring source control into the equation. So now I get more kinds of environments that my team can use just by using source control and the CLI. But if I want to do even more than that, I can introduce packaging into the equation. And you're going to see this slide again at the end. This is sort of the all-you-can-eat smorgasbord here, right? We don't necessarily want to deploy and build apps this way tomorrow. But you can grow into a model like this, where you can use packaging to have sustainable, repeatable artifacts, and you can track changes to those artifacts and store them in source. And things that aren't in your packages, you can also track those changes as well, and you can move them between orgs. And of course, that gray line on the top Change sets UI. We're not taking away your options, we're adding two. And that's what modular development is all about, is giving you more control to use whatever option makes sense for your org. All right? Well, we want to see this in action, Renee. I just was waiting for the demo. Right? So we're going to use, who's heard of the Trailhead Sample App Gallery? Well, now you all have. You can raise your hand. So it's up there at trailhead.salesforce.com slash sample gallery, and we have five sample apps right now that show you different design patterns and best practices, and we're drilling into the Easy Spaces app today because it was built to illustrate patterns you're going to want to look into when you're doing modular app development, when you're trying to separate out things into units. So we're going to go, and Renee and I are playing the part of two developers for Easy Spaces working on changing our app, and we're going to go from nothing in source control to using packaging in the next 30 minutes. That's amazing. And because I'm the older guy, I have to sit. I'm not allowed to, to stay here. So what you see here is our Easy Spaces app. And it's a sandbox. And we figured, while we were developing some features, that we are missing a tab, Reservation Manager. Maybe something that you're familiar with, you're working with something, and it seems something is missing, maybe a permission. So what I'm doing now is I'm just going to set up, and we'll check in my sandbox, the permission sets. We have here our space management app. And in the object settings, let me see if I find my reservation manager. There we go. And you will likely see it now also in the last row that it's not visible, right? Minor change in my sandbox that I have to add now here. Yep. So the fun is when you start changing things in a sandbox, let me quickly check this, is now I have my reservation manager tab over here. So the fun thing is I changed my sandbox. 
and I can bring this with standard chain sets to another environment. But what is going on if I need to bring it to, again, another environment or another environment? How many different chain sets do you have to create? Because there's not one to many option nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. And the best and thing is to bring this to source. Right. Right. So I have here my sandbox. So let's go to my IDE. I'm using VS Code, which has support for the Salesforce CLI. And I set up a blank Salesforce DX project. All those of you who are familiar with uh, Salesforce DX before Dreamforce is you can use it with scratch arcs. But with a new beta feature, you can use the CLI and with that VS Code against any kind of arc. Sandbox, production, developer editions. And we will show this command in action. Yeah. Right? So is this S? Yeah, that's, that's awesome. really great. Yeah, let's go to let's go back to my preferred theme. There you go. SFDX for source. And you will see that we have a few options here. And the new options that we are showing here are deploy and retrieve. These are the better commands that you can use against non-scratch orgs. So what I want to do is I want to use the force source retrieve command. So let's select it. And it gives me a couple of options. I can specify a manifest, a package in XML, as you know it, from standard deployment against any kind of work. Or you can specify the type of metadata that you want to retrieve from the non-scratch arc, like all Apex classes. And in my case, I want to have a package XML because I want to mm -hmm. have clean metadata in my source. And what Rene is doing right now is because this is a blank project, he can't use that other flag that we're going to see in a minute that, that points it to a project directory. So what he's doing is he's saying, OK, I have stuff in a source org that I need to pull down. And he's using a package XML to do that. And Rene, as you're scrolling, I'm noticing what I'm not seeing in this package XML. You don't see a wildcard. I don't want to have any craft in my source, right? I want to modularize from the very beginning. So you're saying you shouldn't try to put everything in your org into one package. Exactly. That's not how you should start. So are you you're sure you're saying that you shouldn't try to put everything in your org into one package? I tried to, but he told me otherwise. So <laughs> it's a, no. You have to be very specific. Don't try, don't pull your whole org, your whole metadata into source. Start small, identify a single app, a single use case, so that you can start playing with this feature. And we're going to share resources that walk you through this part of things, which we know is difficult, in more depth. But getting started, try to just pick a slice. Right, so I'm using now my package XML. And I have authorized my sandbox with a CLI, so it is easy space of sandbox. And let's go. This will now retrieve all metadata based on the package XML from my sandbox. Under the hood, the CLI is using the metadata API. Mm -hmm. As you saw, everything is pulled down and now my force app folder in my project got populated with all the metadata based on the package XML. And what I want to do now is I want to commit this to source. But I know one thing. Before I can give this to Zane, I already know that this will fail to deploy later in the scratch or because we have a flow in here. And flows are sometimes interesting. And this flow has already an active version number of four. I have to decrement this to one. You will run into this when you will play yeah, with Yeah, and when I, when I take over here in a second, you're going to see I'll show you another way that we could get around this. But this is just because he's handing it to me who's working in a non-scratch org. And if you have incompatible version numbers there, you're going to find an issue. Exactly. So I have everything here of my metadata from my sandbox, and now Zane. Did you commit this? I'm going to commit this now. I call it Zane. That's great, right? And we're pushing live to master. What could go wrong? Exactly. 
All right, so we're gonna hope that the internets are with us today and things are fast because now I'm gonna do a git pull. This is live. And you can see I have my same blank project here. So I'm gonna pull down Renee's changes and I'm working, yes, great job. <laughs> I'm working in a scratch org. So one way Renee helped me out is he changed the flow version number. The other way he could help me out is by going into the project JSON and I put this fix in a while ago. You just change the source API version to the latest release. That will also help with that flow specific error. We just wanted to call it out. So rewinding back, I just pulled down all these changes. Now I'm gonna use, I'm gonna get us a little more real estate here. I'm gonna use now the twin of the command that Renee used to pull stuff out. I'm gonna use force source push because I'm going to a scratch org. I'm going to a, an org with source tracking enabled. That's why you're suddenly seeing that source part of the command there. Can we shortly pause there? Just figure out. We pulled metadata from a sandbox and we're de deploying the same metadata without touching it to a scratch org. So you can really build your own development workflow no matter the way, kind of environment. I can yep. also work with a developer pro sandbox in this case. And she decided to work with a scratch org. Yep. Absolutely, and we're waiting for this command to finish, and while we're waiting for this command to finish, I'm gonna go ahead and take us into the org, because I have it open. Oh, there we go, and it finished right behind me. And so in this org, where we now have a whole bunch of different metadata, um, I have been working on a theme, and actually there's one more thing I need to do, and we'll just do it in the UI. I need to assign myself a permission set to see the data that just came in. So here on the permission set screens, we have a whole bunch of stuff you can see, and I'm gonna assign myself two permission sets. I'm gonna give myself access to the app I need to work on. There we go, user, user. And then I'm gonna also give myself access to the objects. Okay, so now that I have permission to see the stuff I just pushed, when I go to the app switcher, you can see we have our space management app. Everything that Renee was working with here for me in my scratch org. Now what I need to do, uh, and you can see I don't have some data so things are showing up beautifully. What I'm doing is I'm working on theming because before this release, Lightning themes weren't deployable via API. And Easy Spaces has a cool custom theme that they like and we've been developing around it but we've had to manually enable it in every environment. It's been really awesome. But with API 44, we can now deploy it via API. So I'm gonna take my Easy Spaces theme that you can see we have right here, and I'm gonna go ahead and just activate it to make sure it's looking good. There it is, gorgeous. It's Renee's favorite. Yes. Mm -hmm. And now I wanna take this change, and I wanna work just like Renee did. I wanna take the change I made in this org, get it down onto my machine, and check it in to source as well. So I'm gonna go back into VS Code, and I'm gonna get us more space here again. And now I'm gonna do a force source pull. I'm gonna ask the CLI to check the diff between what's on my machine and what I just did in the environment I'm working in in my scratch org. So it's checking what's in my files now, and it's gonna pull down, as you can see, and it's telling me what I did. This is, I'm doing positive additions here. We're doing add. If I deleted something, it would show a delete. If I changed it, it would show an update. So I'm not only getting granular information about what just happened, but you can see here, of course, because we're using VS Code, built in is an awareness of what's changed on your machine, and I'm getting the fact that we added this new metadata. Branding sets, content assets, and of course, a lightning experience theme. All the new metadata that came down with what I just did in the UI. So if you're working with people who prefer to work declaratively, this is another way you can capture their changes. So now I'm gonna do the same thing that Renee just did. And I'm gonna, ooh, Remy, that's good. And I'll check my changes in. I love you. And again, <laughs> we're pushing live to master because we are excellent developers. And now Renee, I think it's your turn. Yeah, absolutely. So that's Ring Central. Oh, that's yeah, me. that is. <laughs> so meanwhile, I pulled down Zane's changes. And 
I want to have this source deployable to any kind of work. In my development process, now we are, you know, we are done, yep. we are set. We want to deploy this to a production org, a UAT org. Maybe your company has multiple orgs and you want to reuse this. So we want to avoid that we have to deploy manually via the CLI. We want to give our administrators the capability to install this change source to their org at that time when they want to. And the way to do this is to use packaging, unlock packages. So if you played with it, how many of you have already used an unlock package? A few. How many of them liked it? That's great. Well, it's the same number, minus one. So if you want to work with packaging, um, the team from the engineering team did a real good job by adding a couple of features that makes it really easy to package your source. As I have my source now here, I'm going to create a new package. This is the very first step. SSPX force <coughs> package create. This creates, how do you call this? A space, it a creates space. a bucket not in the, your dev bucket. hub, right? Exactly. It's just reserving that slot. It's not a namespace, right? This is really important to understand. So SSPX force package create takes only a few parameters. First of all, I want to give it a name. So minus n, I'm calling it for Zane. It's great, right? Right, it's great. It's going to be meaningful to the whole company that way. It, it is, exactly, yeah. exactly. I'm setting a minus e because this is just a no namespace, so depending on your needs, you can just define it in here. And I have to specify the package type. So minus t, and this is an unlocked package. Anything else? I think so. I'm missing the path. Yep. Right? Because you can have in one repo, multiple folders that contain or can contain different packages, we have to specify where my source is. And I'm using force app for that. But you might want to put the R in front of that. Yes, darling. And what? if you want to see an example of that, we're going to look at it, that in just a second in GitHub. We'll show you what that mono repo can look like with multiple packages in one org. But for now, we're going to just package everything that's in source in one package. The th thing we kind of told you not to do, but it's okay. It's totally fine, it's totally fine. So everything should, should be set. I'm running this command. It quickly creates a package. And you should see that the SFX project JSON automatically updated with a few, a few information clusters. Mm -hmm. First of all, you're getting an, a version name. You're getting a version number. It's automatically set by the CLI. And if you would you have multiple packages within your project, it would maintain that. And what's the most friendliest way is we're getting an alias, right? For Zane and my beloved 0HO number. You don't have to remember this number. When you're within a project folder, you can then reference this alias for any further commands, which is pretty amazing. And by committing this to source, any other developer who will use this project has this directly at their hands. It is not stored in the dev app. No. So it's just in the project, right? Be aware, you can't look it up at some later point if you're going to, lead, to, to delete this. So what I want to do now is I want to create my package. So I'm using SFX force, not all, package version create, create, which basically creates a version of the current metadata in my project. And this step is the really important step. If you're taking the first first tries at separating out something from the mass that's in production and trying to get it down into a unit, this is where you're going to find out whether or not you've really done a good job. Because you can make a package, you can reserve that space, you're not gonna get a failure unless you type the command wrong. What you will see when you run this command is you're gonna see if you haven't untangled things properly, if you've left something out. Because behind the scenes, the platform, when it runs this command, is gonna to try to generate a version of your package and install it into an org. And just like metadata deployments, the failures that you get there when you have left something out or you're doing it in the wrong order, you're gonna see those same errors when you try to create a version here. Okay, you see a bunch of parameters over here. You won't need them all, right? Just saying. I mean, you might need them. You might need them. For our use case, we don't need them. So I will zoom, zoom up soon. So first of all, I have to specify which package I want to use. So in this case, I can reference my alias for Zane, 
which is pretty cool because I don't have to copy and paste those things from the project JSON file. And the next thing that I want to do is I want to set a minus x because here's an installation key bypass. You don't. You, do you, you need a password? Complain. Do you need to control who can install your package? Exactly. We're saying go ahead and let anyone exactly. install if, it. If you omit this parameter, it will ask for a key. So you have to set one or the other. And the last thing that I need is to set my def up because we are using a ton of them. And I've only two parameters in here. Let's see. I fire the command. It will create a package version that takes a bit of time. And once I'm going to query this command, I should have executed it with the wait parameter, because now you're seeing what's happening when you're just doing what I did. Yep. We have no alias for this package. Version. Version. Thank you. <laughs> you know how, to, how it is working with her, right? <laughs> When you omit the wait parameter, when you're not waiting with a CLI that the package creation process, package version creation process is finished, you won't get an updated alias for this package version in your project JSON. So let me repeat this parameter, and I'm adding minus W, let's say 10. Yep. And this will now run a few minutes, hopefully not. But once this is finished, the CLI will automatically add an alias with a package ID to my SFX project JSON. So for future installments, you can also just reference this alias in any CLI command to then deploy the package to any kind of org, because you can use this today already, right? Package deployment with a CLI. So do you want to show them what this looks like? Should we go to GitHub? Yeah. Beautifully done. Awesome, right? So within our threaded apps, and here specifically the Easy Spaces um, sample app, we are using continuous integration with Circle CI to automatically create package versions based on Git branches. So we, de we defined a Git branching strategy, and depending on which branch we are committing, we are automatically creating a package a uh, package version, we're deploying this to multiple environments, like a UIT sandbox, like a regular sandbox, or a developer edition, for our use case at least. Mm -hmm. And you can use those sample apps, the sample configuration also, to just dig into how you can implement in your CI, CI and CD process package deployment. Because at some point, it should be just a process, right? Mm -hmm. You're committing to source, Everything is fine. The CI process runs. Um, we are running automated tests. You can run UI tests. Then we are deploying to a scratch org. Everything works fine. Awesome. So let's go to the next stage. Let's create a package version, because not everything is packageable today. Right? You should be aware of that. And once this is available, great. Let's move to a sandbox. Right? We are not changing the source. We are just moving forward with the package. And we are also making use of scripting, which is a really great feature of the CLI. And you can see here, I'm just going to zoom in a bit here, that we are basically parsing the output of the project JSON and fetching in a variable the alias of a package version. So we, are, we don't have to take care of anything in our CI and CD process because the CLI and the updates with the package version aliases automatically uh, take care of that. So can you show us that project JSON with the package version in it, just so that we can see what that looks like? Absolutely. So on github.com slash threaded apps, that's the place where you find everything. And this is what we talked about. So Easy Spaces is more complex because we have four packages that give us that space management app. And we're going to keep building on it as we add more things. But it's going to mimic what you're going to see in production. We have the team that works on space management. Maybe they're inside sales. And maybe another team works with another app because they're doing service. And so we're showing you how do you get all those apps separated out of the org, and how do you make sure that then you can push them into a different org in the right order. So we have different packages here. So that space management app is, say, for our inside sales team. And that dependencies line on line 45 46, is how we're telling the CLI on our CI, CD systems or another human, these are the things that have to be installed first. 
it is dependent on those things. And if you scroll up in the project JSON, we're going to get fewer dependencies. And Renee is showing us here now, this is when you have package aliases at the top, our ES base objects package, our ES base code package, those buckets that we said right there. And then below it, the last four lines, those are the versions. So as we want to install a specific version of an app, you can see it right here. If you execute a package version create command and you forget the W parameter, like I always do, then you can run a force package list command and you're going to get information about the package versions you've created. You can get the ID there and you can update it yourself. We also keep this list clean, right? Because in the development process, you'll, you'll likely run into issues with packaging, for example. Something is not working, you have a package version that is created that you no longer would need. We highly recommend that you look into your project JSON because in a year, you may have 100 entries in there, right? So we try to clean up this on every release that we build for our sample apps so that whoever looks at this project knows I can exactly run this version, right? This is the latest status, or this is the status of summer 18, or the status of spring 18. Mm -hmm. All right, so with that, yes, okay. So we took you for a fast spin through easy spaces from unorganized mass in some org somewhere, pulling it down through force source retrieve, getting it into source, then pushing it to a scratch org, and Renee ran some package commands. If you wanna get more hands-on with this and understand what it is we did and get more details, uh, I will show you that slide in a second. I forgot, this is what you just saw. Everything I just said very quickly. We did change set deployment. We did force source push and pull to get it down to our version control. Renee committed it. Then I used force, uh, force source push and pull to get it to the scratch org. And then we did package creation. All of this you just saw, whirlwind tour. But if you want to slow it down and thoroughly understand it, we have some resources. Exactly. So first of all, you find a lot of resources on Trailhead, right? A few new modules and project just got released. We highly recommend unlocked packages for customers and the Salesforce DX development model. Yep. As and, the starters. And brand new is this package development readiness module. This is even going to take you through how do you know if you're ready to start using packages and how do you check your org to see what might be an issue for you. And if you like to read a lot on your commute or at home or at work, we created mm -hmm. two blog series this year around how to get started with Salesforce DX and everything about modular development where we dig into how you can dissect your metadata into packages and how to get started with packaging as well as recommendations for a Git branching strategy, right? Follow those bit.ly links that will lead you directly to developer.salesforce.com to our blogs. There are only, I think, 10, nine or Just 10? Just nine or 10. Yeah, so a bit. Um, great resource to get started with Salesforce DX today. And with that, if you want to see even thing. more, one more thing, T tell us, Renee. Exactly. Salesforce for Developer Keynote, where you will see Zane and Christoph. He's hiding over there. <laughs> exactly. Myself and a few other really cool things that you may have not seen at Reinforce yet. We highly recommend to go there. We want to see you all tomorrow at 1 p.m. And with that, we have time for questions. So um, if you have questions, we're happy to take them. Right. And oh, yeah, <laughs> you're ready for the selfie. We might do that at the end. And we can also bring up the lights if we want. And there's a mic right here. So if people have questions, just queue up at the mic, and we'll take them for as long as we can. Yay! <laughs> Go for it. How can we use the Salesforce DX with the admins or the business users, those who want to make small changes, and then how we can put it into our master repository, how we can integrate this entire this one? Like, uh... Yeah, uh, so that's a great question. So this is why uh, we have this, the sort of everything you want option, and I'll scroll back even a couple more. This one right here, it's going to start with your source control strategy. So if you have strong source control, then you can enable people to work the way that makes sense. So if I like to work in the UI, then you can pair me with a developer who wants to run the source retrieve and source deploy for me and make sure it's checked into source appropriately. If that is not set up correctly, then if I'm gonna be moving stuff around to different environments, it's quickly gonna get into chaos. 
So no. the first thing is to get good source control. No, my question is like, it's a Salesforce, no software, business, they expect that one. Like when you mm -hmm. introduce all these technologies, then they will say like, uh, it's very difficult to use, like, and then like, it is very difficult, it's very hard to implement yeah. the DX. Well, so we're not asking business users to start using the CLI, right? They can keep working the way they've been used to. That, that the whole point of DX is that we're adding options for developers right now, because it's through the CLI, most of it, to do what you need, but your business users, still can use all of the declarative stuff they're used to using today. That's the whole point. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So uh, does the package creation take dependencies into con consideration? Yes, yes, it does. Yes. So if you just deploy a flow, it will deploy everything that is associated with it? Um, well, the package creation process is going to look at the dependencies you've listed, and it will make sure that those are accounted for when it's creating the version. So you have to manually list the dependencies? So, 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 so you mean dependencies that the flow has? Right. right? So, 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 so that, that is basically yeah. how you have to set up your project, right? So if your flow has dependencies to multiple objects, you have to make sure that those objects are in this project. And if you want to dissect that, exactly, so we did this. You see those ES base folders over there? We started to dissect that. We have a package just with the objects. And everything that uses those objects will be installed afterwards. So object is a base dependency for all the other packages. And for example, the main ES base management package won't install if uh, ES base objects is not installed in the org. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, do these packages ever expire? You can manually set them. So the CLI has commands for you to manually expire or deprecate packages. What you can't do right now is delete them, but you can deprecate them. And you have to manually set them as released. It's a flag to be allowed to install them into production. So if you create a package in a package version today, you will only be able to install it in developer orgs and sandboxes until you explicitly set it as released to promote it to production. All right, thanks. Yep. Um, hello. In the resources that you pointed us to, are there like, um, here's, start here, small things, right? Uh, are there things like that in there? Yeah, so in the series we go from, uh, we have an app and we want to try to pull it out. How do we do it? We talk about the pitfalls of slicing and dicing certain ways. There are recommended strategies for how to get started. And the other place that you're going to find those recommendations is on Trailhead in that package development readiness module. It's going to ask you questions so you can gauge what should I start with. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. All right. A real life scenario uh, of having one object from a managed package, which is installed based on a URL, so mm -hmm. it's not, not on app exchange completely. Any suggestions? Considering that our, our, most of our stuff is dependent on that one. So, you know. it, it's just a dependency, right? So you just have to take the package ID and as, uh, that as a dependency to your packages. And your CLI installation process, for example, can be scripted that way, that you first install that package and then install your other packages. Yep. Because uh, Salesforce, the CLI has a, has a command, SFDX force package install. And you just basically pass the package ID as a parameter. It is really, we do yeah, it all the time. You can do that either, whether it's with CI, CD, and your, your system knows to install that first, or you can have your developers install it first, and then you can have your package. But in your package manifest, that's what Renee's saying right here in your project JSON, where you're listing dependencies, you can list managed packages. Which are based on a URL. I the, the, the URL only points to the package ID. Yep. And this is the thing. And the Salesforce CLI t takes the same package ID. So just it, look it at the matter. force package install commands, because the flag you use, will, you can use the URL there. Hi. The uh, retrieve command, does that replace the metadata retrieve and then convert? And convert. Yes, it does. Yes. It's a yep. onesie now. Okay, great. I, that was really fast. I wasn't sure. Thanks. Yeah. Go on. Hi. L let's say that you figured out how to divide all your code in your org in multiple packages, right? So if that's done, you were able to deploy everything into production. You have like five packages or something. And then you have a new application or, or, or something's changed. And then you need to reorganize your packages, mm -hmm. right? My understanding is that every class can only, or every like metadata 
component can only exist within a single package, mm -hmm. right? So it can exist in like two different packages. Right. So what is strategy that we need to follow? Okay, everything's in production, everything has its own package, and then we need to reorganize the whole package. Yep. So how, how is that next deployment going to look like? Do we have to uninstall those existing packages and install everything again with a new... With a new, new structure? With a new structure, but uninstall meaning means like deleting the, the, the actual you know, code from, from the org and... and, and really, uh, yeah, so there are two ways. If you're going to move something from one package to another, oh. if you're going to install those packages at the same time, you could just reinstall the packages because it will perform a delete when you install the first package where you removed it, but yeah. then it will reinstall with the second package. Oh. So you can just reinstall if you're just moving it around. Okay, okay, okay. And I, and I think there is a way to de define dependencies, right? So, yes. Exactly. So if I install like the, the, the starting package, and probably everything yep. will be like that. And that's why, as you see in Easy Spaces, we, we did a... We use the metadata API and the dependencies that you're going to see there when you're deploying, the sort of the order of operations w for deployment as our organizing principle for packages. So that then the more abstract things that depend on your data model being there or shared code being there, that's the strategy we adopted to try to avoid those kinds of things. That if you're changing your code and it should be shared, then put it in that shared code module. Okay. And you know, getting to your happy soup, your org's metadata, and trying to you know, dissect that into mm. packages, it's a process, oh. right? It takes more than a drink for so, a week. So no, that and, and that's yep. the point, right? Because probably you're going to be in production, and then you figure out there is a better way of organizing exactly. things. And you want to say, like, oh, now I have to uninstall everything, and it's my production instance of whether it's. Yep. Yeah. We highly recommend start small and try to identify smaller apps to get a feeling, because now you, you have the options, right? Maybe you're not doing for everything packages. It could be a thing that you're just using for source, retrieve, and deploy for a certain set of your metadata, right? Now you have the options available. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. We're a little bit over, so um, I, I don't know if we have another session or not. Are we good? Yeah, so what Renee and I are going to do is we're going to unhook all our stuff, and we'll meet you out in the hall, and we'll keep answering questions. So thank you all. Thank you.